crashing down on Earth, Earth as it were. Uh, again, uh, the, the question that comes up in this, as many cases is as well, is, is uh, you know, from a Christian perspective, this is considered to be, you know, evil in that sense. Then, what's your what's your stance on that? Or do you think that it's uh, uh, there's something higher going on in that sense, or, or do you think that they're still playing on the on, on evil archetypes and, and people have a kind of a dark uh, kind of urge towards the dark side of power and and uh, and these very strong archetypal forces, and hence it's it's working better, if you know what I mean. We 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 have uh, had almost two thousand years now of being suppressed, if you will, under the Christian Church, and now we're being they they open the ste- steam valve almost now on, on these on the other side of things, the other the dark side, just as you mentioned before in the video game that now we can play the the characters from the other side, you know, finally almost like a liberation <laughs> in that sense, you know what I mean? That and that's that's why it's working. It's it's almost like an an undercurrent of 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 wanting from from people on an unconscious level that they want to identify with the other side now in this polarity. What do you think, Steve? I think the problem itself is the polarities, Henrik. I don't think it's the fact that we're we're on one side or the other. I mean, there's symbols like take take the Baphomet for example, the the Templar symbol with the goat and the the strange serpent symbolism, you show that to any Christian, they're going to flip out. You know, they're going to be like, oh, I'm, this is frightening and devilish. Your, your soul's going to be damned forever, blah, blah. I mean, all it is is a symbol of androgyny. You know, it's a symbol of, of the masculine and feminine combining into one entity, uh, similar to a chimera. And you have the serpents coiling up, up on his staff, covering his heart chakra. And you have his flame of gnosis or knowledge or, you know, Lucifer's flame, again, going back to Venus. And another reason why five is important is the Pythagorean logic is when you slice a, an apple in half, the core is always pentagramic in shape, just, mm, just, yeah. like the, just like the orbit of Venus is. So, you know, the Bible is a complete Masonic work compiled of Jewish, Egyptian, and Eastern mysticism. The, the words of Jesus come from the ancient oracle scrolls of Egypt. All the characters are archetypes of the human psyche and nothing really more than that. And, and all the creation stories of the world speak to this group who hides the sacred teachings from the world. It's the story, again, of Osiris being cut up into 14 pieces and scattered across the Nile. Isis finds all the pieces except the penis, I believe, which she p- replaces with a gold member, or Austin mm-hmm. Powers. <laughs> Austin Powers, AU, is the symbol for gold. So, you know, this is, this is the true meaning of crisis. Isis is is is, which is equivalent to 1111 once again. It's, it's a mirroring. It's a duality. And what's being said is that we have to gather the sacred teachings back together and remember our divinity, just as Jesus gathered his 12 disciples. So Seth, or Satan, was the brother of Osiris who murdered the sacred teachings and, sc- and scattered them to the wind. And the wind of air is the mind of the masses. And you see the cardinal points represented in things like the word news. You know, Henrik, it's north, east, west, and south, you know? Sure, yeah. It paints a little, you know, lightning bolt in your mind when you, when you envision the points connecting at the intricacies, or the, uh, the connecting points. Uh, so the alphabet is the embodiment of divinity. The alphabet is God. This is why we have to be silent in libraries, because we are honoring speech. The library is a tomb of the God of the Word, so to speak. So in the beginning, there was Word. Now, what is Word? Pi, the double-edged sword. In the esoteric tradition, it is forbidden to utter this word, but only pass down the secrets of its power through symbol, because understanding the word enables one to transcend speech or duality completely. And I think that's where we're headed as a species. That's this sort of global village. That's what we're seeing in Avatar. Avatar is another power word with, uh, by the way, Henrik, with the truncated pyramids being the three A's, as in Avatar, Abraxas, Fantasia, mm-hmm. Atlanta, you know, which is Atlanta's shorthand for Atlantis. And all these contain the three A's, which have five connecting uh, points once again, so they're pentagramic in nature. If you take the three A's out of Avatar, which are three pentagrams out of Avatar, you have VTR, which is shorthand for virtual reality. So you have these power words encoded in our movie titles that you don't necessarily think about on the surface, but are hitting your consciousness so incredibly hard. And you're, you're watching these movies that are, you know, very propagandized by the military complex and things like that. And so you have to sort of be careful when you're watching Avatar. That's why a lot of people were leaving the theaters feeling quite depressed because they're, they're living in this incredible utopian world next to these uh, ETs called the Na'vi, these blue ETs, which, by the way, the word Na'vi comes from our, our word navigation. It's yes. our, our navigational unit in the seas. So basically, so it's, they're telling you to follow the navi, navi, the navigational units, follow their lead. They're, they're paying homage to nature. They're in touch with each other. They're, they have this symbiotic relationship to one another, all the animals and plant life, and also their ancestors. 
And so the, the theater lights go up and you're, you're sitting there in your IMAX seat and you have to go back to your very box, right angled uh, oriented boxy car that uh, consumes a lot of the natural resources of the earth. And you have to go back to your, again, right angled apartment, which is very compressing and, and restricting of your consciousness. And the tendency just feels a little bit depressed because it seems insurmountable. It seems almost impossible to get into uh, to, to create this world into the utopia that you just witnessed in Avatar, which was like a, an almost complete virtual reality experience since it was 3D. And James, mm-hmm. it's not a coincidence that you have great great directors like James Cameron behind the lens on those things. And how, and it, JC. Yeah, there you go. JC, Christ Resonator, again. Yeah. Um, and I mean, in terms of if you just spend a little bit more time on Avatar, I think it was very... Uh, I, I still feel, though, the, the very much of the the polarity being played out there as well, that... that Obviously, it's symbolic um, message, at least for me in the movie, was this uh, uh, choice in that sense that that we're we're faced with. E- either you go down the industrial route, so to speak, that we 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 do stuff with with tools, we we use our you know brains in that sense and do something with it, or we go down only the other route, which is uh, totally giving up all of that and 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 just showing that the polarity of of choice in in that f- film as, as well. And and to me, that was very kind of. Uh, uh, claustrophobic actually watching that uh, f- from that perspective that it, it we're not put in in front of this um uh on a level where we can actually incorporate a little bit of both it's it's always either or scenarios that that we're faced with and and in terms of avatar i feel that that comes through very much um you know connecting with the whole green you know movement a- as well and i think that many people on the emotional level uh therefore will kind of uh you know, uh, associate themselves or identify with the with the Navi in in that sense. You know, uh, it's Definitely. a very powerful, very powerful movie. You know, what, what do you think uh, of, the, of the film? Otherwise, Steve, I, I think uh, it, well, you summed it up pretty nicely. I I think again, it's this duality, this idea that we're separated, that uh, that we're separated into two genders, that there's light and dark, that we're constantly celebrating the dawn of the new day and the and the sun setting and. And having to play on light and darkness and, and trapped in a, in a world of duality. Um, if you were a being, for instance, that could see outside of time, a fourth dimensional being, you would see our present day and future as sort of a, a situated event. Again, back to Goro's time river theory, the Nile River is a representation of the actual geological history and future of the planet. It, it, mm-hmm. Every time it curves or, or does a certain... Every time there's this strange uh, shift in the river's path that something incredible happens as far as our epics in time, like the go back to ancient Sumer or ancient Egypt, and um, it's located near Cairo, which is where we get the word chiropractor. So you can also see that it's like the uh, chakras or the, the different vertebrae in our spine going up the river. So we're, we're bodily embodiments of things like these gigantic rivers that were supposedly dug by the gods or mapped to map out the, uh, the future of the planet. And the Nile empties into the sea, I think, in around 2093 by his model. So what that could mean in one, one perspective is that we will eventually get, get free of this dualistic system, get free of being entrapped in time, or at least feeling like we're entrapped in time. Uh, so things like mortality, longevity will not be an issue for us anymore as a consciousness. Uh, but do, do you think our, our choice that in that sense, if we t- also tie in a little bit more with Avatar, to me, I mean, Avatar also shows the... Um, how it might be possible for us to go into a virtual world as well, that we might be offered the the Fox, so to speak, version of of uh, of this non-dual duality, or rather live in a world where we totally can manifest what we want to see or create our own world. I'm not saying, again, that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that we might be offered to, to go into it just as he does in, in the film Avatar. He connects into this kind of uh, pod in that sense, which, you know, which downloads his soul or consciousness into this other <laughs> body and we don't even know really if he's having this as a whole virtual reality experience or not or if he's if he actually is in a real uh world if you follow my line of thinking ah, Steve. very good henrik it's the soul of, of a new machine philosophy right there it's um yeah it's you know transhumanism and uh what we're gonna do when we eventually create a machine that's more intelligent and more dynamic thinking than us maybe not the same spirit maybe not the same heart but when the intellect surpasses ours, are we going to trade some of our humanity, our essence for bioware, for upgraded vision, for upgrading hearing, um, you know, for paraplegics to be able to walk again? And um, these are all real possibilities. And, and, you know, even scarier, you mentioned that we eventually just create uh, another virtual microcosm within this macrocosm and entrap ourselves even more. And that could be another explanation of the time wave zero phenomenon where we eventually create an, an artificial world, a virtual world, 
that is so compelling, even more compelling than Avatar. I'm talking like light years ahead of Avatar uh, to where we can basically just implant our consciousness into any reality that we want. A utopian one where we feel no pain, we feel no suffering. And this is a human, this is an obstacle we have to overcome as a species. We have to choose whether we're going to stay the organic route and, and be true to honesty in our spirit and evolve with the cosmos in that way or to fall further into helplessness and feel like we cannot make our world that beautiful utopia ourselves. We're going to have to create a synthetic version of it. And, you know, there's, there's role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. Um, or there's one called Shadowrun where you gradually trade up your human essence for Bioware upgrades. And as you go throughout the game, the more upgrades you get, the, the, the lower and lower your bio essence gets. So you're trading, again, you're trading your humanity for this sort of Android Terminator uh, technology. And it's going to be compelling for a lot of people to take advantage of that type of system. But we're going to see a lot of high weirdness before we get to that point. I mean, there's still the, our friends above us that are constantly circling, circling the planet. I just watched a, a great documentary by Jose Escamilla called Moon Rising where it, show, it shows the moon's absolutely teeming with activity, going back to Richard Hoagland's research, where you see all the citadels and strange structures on the moon and how it just seems very likely that there is a lot of activity in our own little solar system right here. So what are we going to learn from their, their great wisdom, their vast knowledge that's slowly trickling down here and probably has been here for some time? Perhaps they'll have a word of advice about this sort of zero-point artificial intelligence that we're approaching. Uh, do you think that um, these um, creatures, beings, entities, whatever, are uh, managing our, our experience in that sense? Do they govern us in, in one way or another? Or do you think that they stay back and actually hold their own uh, place and, and, and space, so to speak, until we are, uh, I don't know, maybe you know, ready to, to get in contact with them? I mean, I mean, this is the question that comes up all the time as well. I mean, are we truly ready how, how would that work out if, if another species came down here and, and all of a sudden maybe offered us a lot of you know solutions or whatever in terms of you know technology or energy and things like that because i feel that the human species has a lot of potential as well and and as long as the uh, the power structure is not holding us down we would you know we would be far more advanced in our own technologically and also kind of a mental ability than we are today and and for, for this species or entities to come down too soon could it could even be you know detrimental meaning that we would become dependent on them for various reasons uh and that's kind of a little bit of a, a danger in that scenario as well what do you stand on that steve absolutely i mean it's again it's human 2.0 it's like the movie surrogates with bruce willis um we don't we don't need um someone to bail us out of our own problem right now we need to get ourselves out and i think the majority of ets that are here and that are visiting i just saw this footage from China last month, I just posted it on my Facebook, of this sort of gigantic cone-like tetrahedral craft with a, a diamond uh, a subcraft coming out of it and then doing a complete 360 motion around the, the ship. And if it's not CGI, it's one of the most beautiful sightings I've ever seen. Um, I think that the majority of them are just observing us like we go to the zoo and we observe panda bears and that kind of thing. Um, are we the zoo? Uh, is, yep. the, is this the zoo for them? <laughs> this, this is the zoo for them, yeah. And I think that some of them I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure if, if the, the ones that are coming in craft that are physical are the ones that are controlling the societies, the uh, elite echelons. But I do know, well, I have a really good sense. I don't have an absolute knowing. Um, just from people I've talked to in secret societies and, and organizations that, that, like the Tool, the Tool Society, the Tool Society in Germany, um, Masonic organizations, I do know at the very upper echelons, they at least believe that uh, there is an extraterrestrial leadership, uh, governance um, it could be some kind of transdimensional governing body, some kind of daemon that's piloting them or controlling their thoughts and using them as this uh, as a food source, like surviving off humanity uh, parasitically. That would explain the the sort of way that we're still confused, the way that our language is still confused and we feel imprisoned here. Um, but I don't think they have absolute power over us. I think that a lot of the ciphers and the clues and the answers to the human riddle to this this great question, uh, this movement away from duality, is not hidden from us. It's kind of in plain sight. I mean, we've just been talking about some of the incredible ciphers that we can see in language right now. I mean, you could you could end this podcast with me and and diverge some kind of incredible secret using the mathematical code of pi or the golden mean and just applying it to our alphabet. And you're able to do that. They're not stopping you from doing that. Um, you know, there's all kinds of theories. You could you could wax intellectual about it forever about why these dimensional entities would want to harvest us, feed off us, that kind of thing. Uh, perhaps they don't have souls. Perhaps they're robotic in nature. 
perhaps they're envious of human beings because they are eternal, whereas they have to exist in three dimensions for eternity. So, you know, perhaps if, if their kingdom is on Earth, Henrik, that would make sense why they want to control us so, so much. They don't have an afterlife to look forward to because they are artificial in nature. They, they're lacking the stuff of souls. I mean, that's just one possibility. But you can, yeah, like, again, yeah. you can philosophize about that forever. Absolutely. Uh, hey, before you mentioned a little bit of um, the diamond uh, symbolism as well. And if we wrap things up here for the for the first hour, at least. And Jay, uh, what do you think about JC? I mean, I heard a uh, interview with him recently where he 